This is Digital Health Today, episode 42. There's been so much friction in the system. You know, finding the right patients with the right experience and knowing how to work with them easily is, has been the primary problem that we're not trying to solve. Welcome to Digital Health Today, the podcast focused on the leaders, innovators, and technologies transforming healthcare today and tomorrow. Find us online at digitalhealthtoday.com. This episode is brought to you by Medible, the app and analytics company for healthcare. Medible invites you to try its Axon solution. Axon makes clinical research easy with its clicks, not code technology. Create your first clinical trial app in just a few minutes. Go to www.medible.com to get a demo today. That's www.medible.com. Welcome back. This is Digital Health Today, the place to be to get the insights of leaders working to make the healthcare of tomorrow available today. I'm your host, Dan Kendall, and this is episode 42. In our previous conversation, we spoke with the co-founder of Health 2.0, Matthew Holt. His work has really catalyzed the health tech industry behind this new set of technologies that's really positioned to transform healthcare as we know it. He gave us a long-awaited explanation of his preferred term, smack health. I'm not sure that's going to catch on, but regardless of whether you call it mHealth, eHealth, digital health, or something else altogether, it's definitely been accelerated due to the work that he and his co-founder, Indu Sabaya, have done for over 10 years driving the Health 2.0 organization. In fact, as this podcast comes out, you'll still have time to head out to Santa Clara, California to join Matthew and about 3,000 other innovators for the 11th annual fall conference. It's a great meeting and one I hope you'll check out. Our guest today is actually going to be at Health 2.0, and you'll have a chance to meet him. And actually, I think our sponsor for this episode, Medible, will be there. So be sure to reach out to Michelle Longmire and Tyler Pugsley while you're there. Tell them that you heard about them on this podcast. It's always nice for our supporters to know that their involvement is having an impact. Before I jump into the conversation with today's guest, let me fill you in on a few things. There are a bunch of great conferences that are happening around the world over the next few months. If you haven't done it yet, go check out the website, digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash events and take a look. There are really some awesome opportunities coming up to meet other innovators, share and develop new ideas, and accelerate your success. There are loads of great events on there. I've mentioned Health 2.0, which is running October 1st to the 4th in Santa Clara. Some of the other ones that stand out, here's one a lot further east over in Estonia, in fact. It's the eHealth Talent Meeting that's happening on October 16th to 18th. Actually, our friends over at ECH Alliance are kicking off the Digital Health Society at that event, so that should be definitely worth checking out. There's also Pioneers Health in Amsterdam on October 25th, and of course, there's the exceptional Exponential Medicine Conference by our friend Dr. Daniel Kraft on November 5th through the 8th in San Diego. Just a great combination of venue and content and leaders and organization and all that sort of stuff. Jumping back over to Europe, there's Frontiers Health, which is being held in Berlin, November 16th and 17th, and that's followed by Giant Health in London on November 28th to the 30th. The list goes on right up until the winter holidays, and don't even get me started about the great conferences coming up in January, starting with the Digital Orthopedics Conference, Startup Health Festival, J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference, CES, and Digital Health Summit, all kicking off in 2018. So we we have a, a great series of events coming up, and I hope you do check it out, and hopefully we'll have a chance to meet you in person at some of these events. What did I leave out? Visit the website and check out digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash events. And if you have an event, be sure to go in and enter it into the site. It's free and it's easy to do. There's a link right there on that page. You can just add that yourself. It goes into one of our moderators and we'll get that posted and your event will be on there as well. All right, now let's talk about our guest. With me today is a lifelong health marketer, serial entrepreneur, and internet pioneer. And I don't use that expression lightly. Jack Barrett is currently the founder and CEO of WeGo Health, and he's developed some excellent experience through his career working with leading companies like Yahoo, and he's going to share with us some of his insights on how digital and health are colliding and how we can do things better. Jack is a frequent public speaker, blogger, Twitterer, you can find him on Twitter at Healthy Jack, and he's an author. He lives in Boston with his wife, Kelly. She's an art dealer if you're in the market. And by his own confession, he's a strong believer in the health benefits of red wine. In this episode, we take on one of the big challenges facing innovators, which is focused on these two key words, patient-centric. We talk about it all the time, and no one is going to argue that the patient is not the priority. But how do we actually do it? How do companies actually achieve patient centricity? Well, a lot of people think that you simply get patients involved in your business challenges, but if you've ever tried to do that, you know it's a lot harder than it sounds. Jack's going to share with us his seven secrets of successful patient collaboration, and I think you're really going to find this useful. To make it easier for you, you don't need to take notes. Jack and his team have developed a download that you can grab on the show notes for this episode. Go download it on the website at digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 42. While you're there, please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And you know I love it when you write a review. That really helps spread the word and grow our digital health community. Now let's tune into the conversation with Jack Barrett. 
Jack, welcome to the program. Thanks, Dan. Good to be here. Jack, it's good to have you here. I've been looking forward to having this conversation since we first connected. We're going to cover some things that I frequently get asked about, and I can't wait to crunch through some ideas with you about patient collaboration. But first of all, let me ask you, you've been in the health arena for years, since it looks like the early days of the internet, uh, since about 1993 with an, an agency there. Tell me, how did you find yourself working at the intersection of health and tech so early in your career, and what are some of the highlights of your career so far? Well, I, I really was excited by the, the need of health to have a personalization aspect to it from the very beginning. And, and you know, pre-internet, that meant interactive technologies that allowed us to do things like choose the path that a patient might want to take on their own through a patient journey of education or for a physician to choose a journey through their education. So things like, you know, God help me, video discs and interactive laptop-based programs even preceded my work on the internet. And, and healthcare requires that, right? That endless need for personalization and customization um, just demands that we have technology involved, even on the marketing side of what happens. Then when you move into, of course, the collaboration between care providers and patients, that, that personalization is even more important. But you got involved on the agency side. I mean, what, what was the draw that got you involved to, to work on the agency side so early on? I mean, 1993, that was when you know, Mosaic and some of the early browsers were just getting started. So what mm -hmm. was that real draw there? What were the opportunities that unfolded at that time? Well, I've been in, in healthcare marketing in, even before um, you know healthcare marketing was an acceptable practice, right? When working for the Tufts University uh, Medical Center as my first job out of Tufts University undergrad. But the reason that I got so excited about the agency space is that it, it, it felt like the entire world was trying to figure out interactive technology and then, of course, the internet. And that's that's what agencies and consultancies do best is is demystify and, and find ways to apply those those new technologies. So if there's anything I would use as a critique of my own career, it's that I'm, I'm always so looking for the bleeding edge thing that sometimes we run past the immediate, we stop, we, we see the elephant, we take a quick bite and keep running while other folks stop and feed on it. Well, we're always looking for what's new. And I think that's what agencies and consultancies do best is to help, you know, when there's confusion or something new, it's, that's where they raise the most value. And I definitely want to dive in deep into the projects that you're working on right now. But before you started your current company, you were with Yahoo for a number of years, actually, almost four years. And that was at a really interesting time, I'm sure, 2003 to 2007, um, when you were working with them. What was that experience like, and what were you doing there? It was, it was a great time. And, and you know, when, when Yahoo really was at, at I believe, the, the peak of its game, and I was pulled in from a, from a very a thriving consulting practice um, that had grown out of the sale of my agency um, to Omnicom at that and, and the consultancy was working with big pharma, working with small startups and, and a host of other folks on their digital marketing. At that time, we didn't even know to call it that. But Yahoo came knocking and, and offered a position that was really unique and exciting, which was a virtual publisher over the health portion of Yahoo. So I really looked at the advertising sales and revenue generation side on the, and, and all of healthcare for Yahoo, as well as the content and, and traffic driving strategy of Yahoo Health, right? So at that time, the goal was, you know, how do we catch WebMD? They're, they're number one by a long shot. At that time, Yahoo was number eight in terms of health traffic, which was a dismal performance given that we were the number one most trafficked website of, in the world at that time. So um, I'm proud to say that in the four years I was there, we, we went from number two to number number eight to number two behind WebMD. So that was the way you measured things in a media company was, you know, where are we in the traffic race in a lot of ways? It was a great experience because it was a way for me to really experiment in a laboratory of 150 million consumers who were constantly bouncing around, not just health, but all kinds of content and and to see what genuinely excited and engaged them and then see what, what part of it was different for health and you know, some of the lessons I learned there, you know, really spawned what's, you know, WeGo Health, which is what we've been doing for the last 10 years, as you know. But I discovered it at Yahoo, this audience of folks who, at the time, we were, were giving talks about social media. What is it? What does UGC stand for? And how can you use it as an organization in our desire to be thought leaders out in the industry? And and I was also really searching for a way to, to make Yahoo Health not just another encyclopedia of information about diabetes 101 but an engaging interactive platform and not and beyond tool sets it was about people talking to other people and so at that time i looked back at yahoo groups which had been there for a long time just organically started by yahoo users with no help or support from anyone there were thousands and thousands of health groups 
you know, there was one de depression group with over 10,000 members talking to each other, led by one person who was, he had said, look, I'm, I get no, no payment. I, I only derive, you know, the mission value, the passion of wanting to help other people from being a leader of this ragtag group of people on this freeform platform. And there was more activity and excitement and genuine conversation there than there was in anything we could content we could rent from a third party or even even build from our own mind. So my I said about combining the social media parts of Yahoo before we even knew to call it social media into Yahoo Health. And and in that social media exploration, I discovered uh, what we now call patient leaders. So there are a small number of folks. We kind of pegged the number at about 4% of the total online patient universe that create 80% of the content and do, and frankly, they consume 80% of the ads and they do lots of other things that don't make media companies that happy. But when you want to make real healthcare change happen, these are the people that you know are the change agents. They are somehow intrinsically motivated to go out there and help as many other people as possible, see change through, you know, drive through not just their disease, but through the hairball that is healthcare now and make things happen. So I, I said about saying, how can we, how can we get you know, more in touch with this subgroup of the Yahoo audience, you know, out of that 150 million, we've now found 10 years later, there's about a hundred thousand people that are members of our network who are, who are really driving the patient conversation. So you mentioned that you've been involved in healthcare marketing before healthcare marketing was an acceptable term. What did you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, honestly, when I, Went to do public relations at that time, you know, fresh out of college at Tufts for the Tufts University Nutrition Center on Research and Aging. There was not even hospital marketing to say, you know, we're that we are the leader in heart transplant surgery. There was not tertiary care marketing. There was, the pharmaceutical ads were yet to be approved by the FDA. On there was no first ad on TV for pharma. So this was really pre-consumer marketing for the whole healthcare industry, from from pharma to providers to payers. And the, the idea of doing public relations to promote this Tufts Center was even a little bit edgy, that there was, a, 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 at that point, a, you know, a well-regarded major PR firm that was hired to promote the Tufts University Center. It was like, why should you do that? Everyone should just find you through their doctors, and organically you'll be, because of your reputation, be discovered. But it was a time when industry was saying, we have to get over that. We're, we're becoming competitive, even as a nonprofits, even as, as um, university or, or tertiary medical centers. We need to see our our value as businesses and, and get the word out there. So there was certainly a little pushback at that time on, gee, it must be nice that you know, these guys have money to spend on a PR firm versus helping patients. And now, of course, marketing, communication, education, and, and you know, making sure patients know what's available to them is, is completely acceptable and, and growing by leaps and bounds. So it was, I liked it because there was tension <laughs> at the time, and it, it, but also we were, we were discovering and inventing best practices um, back in those days. So you left Yahoo in 2007, which is mm -hmm. the, the time period where Facebook was really beginning to make an impact. Mm -hmm. What were you seeing there at Yahoo? Were you there and you had an idea to start a business or did you leave and, and uh, search for a problem that you wanted to solve by starting a business? So tell me about that mm -hmm. transition and, and what you're working on now. Well, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to have um, good friends who were partners at uh, General Catalyst, A-list venture firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who, with whom I would vet various investment opportunities in the in the now we would call it digital health space. And so folks would come in and do their pitch and I would be there as you know still working at Yahoo, kind of give them um, my perspective on the market and how this how this pitch would fit there. So I got to know the general catalyst folks there very well. I, I put them in the very thin book of good guy venture venture capitalists. And we said, look, this social media Right, the the peer to peer communication among consumers who are making decisions based on their authentic trust for each other's opinions and healthcare belong together. They must be put together. And let's find a way to build a company around that. And then, of course, I told them the story of this audience of what we now call patient leaders, who we then called things like health activists and, and super users that were kind of this core audience that really no one had discovered yet. And we funded We Go Health right then and there. So I left Yahoo because I, I was lucky enough to get seed funding from General Catalyst and founded We Go Health on the promise of, you know, what's we have a key hypothesis of how to how to make a business around this spectacularly engaged patient audience, um, but let's let's figure it out from there. Ten years later, we've we've learned a lot of lessons, but that's how it all started. And imagine that the marketplace has changed a lot. I mean, I get asked on various projects and clients that I've worked with on both sides of the Atlantic. You know, I get asked to take products and get 
feedback from potential users. And, you know, for a large part of my career, that was those users were doctors, they were surgeons, they were nurses, they were the, the professionals who were interacting with the, the products that the companies I was working with and for were making and selling. Over the past six and 10 years, those products have become largely software-based and the projects that I've had the opportunity to work on have been very consumer focused or, or you know user focused in terms of how is the patient going to actually interact with this. This product has a connection piece, whether it's a glucometer or an implantable heart sensor or a telemedicine system. There's some component of it that's going to be used by a person who's not a healthcare professional. And one of the things I expressed to you was that the difficulty in actually trying to find the patients who can can give you the input. What are some of the things that you've seen as companies and marketers are trying to understand that user voice? Uh, and what are some of the challenges that they have? And then I want to talk about some of the tips and tricks on how to do that successfully. Well, I think exactly that. We all know that companies want to be patient-centric or patient in, patients included, whatever terminology you want to use. And, and everyone talks about it, but they're really not doing it. I mean, it, and we look at their, with, with some exceptions, the, the genuine involvement and collaboration with patients isn't happening. So there have to be problems there. And, and of course, you know, as a company that, that looks at the most active and, and skilled patient experts as our core audience, we're saying, why, why aren't you bringing these people into your, into your organization to help with, as you said, the design of your product, the implementation of it as, a, as an execution can be supported by patients, and then, and then the long-term you know, social support. Why aren't you collaborating? And the reality is there's kind of three things that we look at as problems, right? It, it's, believe it or not, hard for organizations of almost any size, including big providers with hundreds of patients or thousands of patients they treat on a monthly basis, finding a patient with the right experience is still a challenge, right? So that basic recruitment is is hard. But I think even harder, and this is what people don't like to talk about because it feels crass or insensitive, is that you know, finding a patient who can genuinely help with your, let's call it a business challenge, right? And even if you're a nonprofit, you're trying to solve a, a business issue as I look at it. And finding that patient who, who I believe you said when we talked a few months ago, you know, to have a full day of talking to a patient for an hour of value doesn't fit into the reality of especially fast moving digital health companies or even big companies that have a lot of other things going on. They need someone who can contribute as a peer. And that's, that's challenging. So that vetting hasn't existed and you've had to kind of find your way through and and one of the one of the challenges, for example, was okay. We found a person. They came in for the day, and now we don't want to use them again. How do we say goodbye? And uh, that that process of vetting, I think, is key. Um, but the third thing is is also, as I said, you know, how do you contract that person? How do you pay them? How do you manage the process? So there's been so much friction in the system that I don't think it's a desire to work with patients or bad experiences working with patients. I think that the, you know finding the right patients with the right experience and knowing how to work with them easily is has been the primary problem that that we're not trying to solve. I agree 100% with everything you said there. There's an additional perspective of what the patients are going through. And there was a project I was working on a few years ago, and we wanted to, to try to get the feedback from a group of hypertension patients. And the one of the doctors that I was working with suggested that we contact the Pulmonary Hypertension Association and see if they could get a, a group of patients that would come together and travel in. Most of them for, took about an hour door to door, some even further to come in and spend some time and take a look at some of these products and give us some feedback and tell us uh, about their experiences. And we spent, I guess, all told it was about half a day with these patients. And the, the irony was, I mean, these patients went through a lot to get there because they were committed. They wanted to try to be involved in something that could help themselves or help other people. But these were very sick patients and they went through a lot and put themselves through a lot in order just to even get to the venue uh, much less spend a day uh, doing this. And then they were exhausted by the end of it, even though it was only a few hours long. And it wasn't a great experience for them. And the the really sick patients that we really wanted to contact were too sick to even get out of the house, right? And those are the people we really needed to figure out how we could engage with them with this particular product. So, you know, there's also that that aspect of, you know, who do you find? How do you find them? And are they the really uh, the, the right ones to represent the really sick people in that instance that you're trying to reach? Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talk a lot about, you know, considering the health realities of, of 
the patient experts you engage with. And, and if you're going to be engaging them for a long term, you know, your your contract should include, okay, if you get sick and need to take a, a, a hiatus, how are we going to deal with that in, in, in our financial arrangement? As if you're an advisor or a company, you're, you're collaborating as a peer with us. We want you to be accountable on the team. But the reason that you're so incredibly powerful and valuable is because you have a serious illness and that, that has to be incorporated. It, and it, I think those kinds of things have stopped companies from working more closely with patients and, and, but they're avoidable and there's best practices that if we share them and, and help, especially the, and even the patients themselves to offer, you know, Hey, I have a contract I use and I, yes, I have, um, I have RA and that means I, I may get too sick to be able to move out of my house. So this is, I usually, you know, go to a video conferencing platform when that happens. This is, is that okay with you? Let's put it in the contract and getting that stuff up front and, and out of the way can, can avoid both the breaks in the workflow, which is the reality of why businesses get, you get skittish about working with patients and, and patients own needs being ignored for sure. Well, I think a lot of people who are listening can understand a lot of the problems. And when you and I connected to scope out the content of this podcast, you very generously put together with one of your colleagues. Was it Dalen? Dalen, yes. Yeah. So you and Dalen put together some tips, a beautiful, beautiful sheet, I might add, uh, that I'm going to encourage people to go to the website and download. But these are seven secrets for successful patient collaboration. So I just want to go through them there. So everyone who's listening can go to the website and download these in the show notes. So you don't have to worry about if you're driving or working out, you can, you can, you don't have to take any notes, you're going to be able to download this. But Jack, can you help me go through these seven secrets and why they're so important and how people can have successful collaboration with patient experts? Sure, sure. I'll go down them in order, and I, I um, perhaps some stories to illustrate them. Number one, that and these are these are in something of a rank order for us is to engage patient experts as as peers, not test subjects. It's very different to be patient centric, which is a great term, but we think of it as you know there's a there's a round table and there's patients in the middle, and everyone is, it's a, it's a petting zoo. Everyone's kind of patting the patient down and saying that you know, what are you feeling now? Tell us how you feel. What we encourage companies to feel comfortable doing is is put patients who you vetted as the runs ready to get to work with you at the table next to you, hold them accountable, ask them to be a partner in your project and, and treat them as colleagues. It, it's surprising how clearly these folks understand the business needs you may have as a small company startup or as a big company with regulatory challenges and, and are willing to work with you on those. So uh, treat them as peers, not test subjects. Um, the next one is a change in the way that I think companies need to think about working with patients. There, there have been a lot of Patients should just work with us to help the world. And increasingly, though, we're saying you need to compensate fairly for the expertise you're getting, right? If, if a patient expert is coming to the table, um, not only as a patient, but as a professional, there's going to be a fee involved. And to recognize that value is also part of how you have your organization understand that we're, we're paying for this time as well, not just to be nice, but because we expect an output. And that, that just helps everyone to see this as, a, as making progress, not just a chat. And one of the things, I tell the story of Julie Cerrone, who's our network manager, I mean, network director, I should say. She's an ex-Deloitte consultant, was you know, a rock star Deloitte consultant who was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis and now runs and had to come off the road, right? No more 2 a.m. team meetings with Deloitte and running these huge gigs. She had to stop, get well enough that now she runs our, our network full time. Um, but she's someone that if you hired her as a as a patient collaborator, you would sure as hell want to pay her for her expertise as a business professional, as well as her understanding of psoriatic arthritis. So compensate people for their for their expertise. So let me dive into that one a little bit then. So mm -hmm. you said compensate fairly and on this sheet that mm -hmm. I've got in front of me is to compensate fairly for the requested expertise. So what is fair? How do you quantify that? And how do you get a number that uh, isn't going to, going to offend? Uh, it's not being overly generous. I mean, that's, that's the sort of right amount for what you're asking them to do. It's a really tough and it's a really good question. On the platform that we launched called We Go Health Experts, where, where we're matching people real time to patient experts to engagements like this, that's the most frequently asked question is what should I pay? And we're helping to start, let folks see, for example, the typical cost to record a video for a manufacturer is you know two to four thousand dollars that sort of thing so there's not a lot of price transparency in that space but uh, fairly I think if you look at a benchmark for example in market research you know what do you typically pay a typical consumer to be in a focus group 
what would you pay someone who is now an expert and a leader and a, you know, a KOL physician versus a typical physician? And so think of doubling the focus group pay. It, there's, there's a little bit of trial and error in there right now, but in many ways, it simply says, look, this is a full day of someone's time. What's a reasonable day rate? I don't have to break it out at an hourly or worry about a lot of detail, but, but if we're saying you know, it's, a, it's a full day of time, including travel, then what's a, what's a reasonable day rate for that? It, it's, it's a good question, and I wish I could answer it very, very clearly, but the, part of the key is compensate at all. And it's shocking how many companies say, well, our, our regulatory team is uncomfortable with paying someone to be here. It's like, that's, but they're, they're taking a vacation day. They bring business expertise. Would you not pay a consultant? Because it would, it would, it's inappropriate. These are, these people should be seen as consultants, not just patients. So I, I guess the question about fairness and compensation is probably very closely related with your next point, which is right. around setting the goals and expectations. Because uh, I mm-hmm. think if, if organizations can identify what it is they want to get out of a, a project and, and, and uh, an engagement, then the value of that engagement will be more clear. So can you tell us about the next one? Sure. But I mean, exactly. Sharing clear business goals and expectations is, is, again, part of that different relationship between a patient as a test subject and someone who you're expecting to be a, a collaborative peer who's accountable as part of your team. And, and patient experts who've worked through us and, and with companies in this say this this really helps them that they too often people are trying to make a make nice with the patient instead of being clear about what's expected of them as part of a business team and i keep using the word business because that's okay it's we want to break through some of those barriers of treating treating patients um, you know with kid gloves and instead treating them as as peers so be explicit about deliverables that you know how time frame deadlines you know that that ties into what we talked about before, which is the health realities of you know, what if there's going to be a delay based on sickness, how do we handle that? But clear goals and expectations uh, it, and not holding back, not feeling that you need to sugarcoat that because these are patients, because these are patient experts. These are, these are the folks who stepped up and said, I wish to collaborate. I wish to be a part of the, of the real business process. Excellent. Okay. What's the next one? Uh, the other thing is to be candid about the company and its goals. And, and again, this is part of getting over the sugarcoat concern that I think happens a lot where I can we really tell a company that we're that we're the fourth drug to market and we'd like their help on how to be differentiated from our competitor yes you can and as long as what you're providing is educationally useful to their community they're good they will help you with that don't don't be opaque about what it is that actually you need to get accomplished as a digital health company look we need to drive downloads that's what our investors are looking for and frankly long-term use is a little less important to us right now to share that candid background about you know what's going on with the company where it's heading and your goals it helps them to be more prescriptive and helpful for you and and the, the, the tremendously positive feedback we've gotten from patient experts who, who get this kind of insider track and feel that they're um, accepted as part of the company is really useful. And of course, they've signed NDAs and everything else that they need to, to be sure that they, like any other consultant you would hire, they're involved in, in keeping that you know, confidential when it needs to be. We'll dive back into our discussion in just a moment, but I wanted to take a quick second to tell you about this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Medible, the app and analytics company for healthcare. You may have heard my interview with Medible CEO, Dr. Michelle Longmire in episode 29. Medible is a fast growing company that was just named by the San Francisco Chronicle as a startup to watch. There's a lot of buzz about this company because Medible combines deep healthcare knowledge with cutting edge Silicon Valley technology. Its solutions are disrupting the $30 billion clinical trial outsourcing market. $30 billion, that's a market ready for disruption. It's no secret that clinical trials continue to grow more complex and patient recruitment and retention are a major challenge to sponsors. Today's protocols are more demanding than ever, and frequent travel to clinical sites often discourages patients from long-term participation in studies. Did you know that 25% of patients drop out before study completion? In many studies, 50% or more visits could be relocated to a patient's home. For decades, the clinical trials industry has been saddled by legacy technology and workflow inefficiencies. Medible puts patients first and uses mobile tools to bring anywhere, anytime technology to improve recruiting and patient retention. Medible solutions include functionality that replaces e-source, e-consent, and EDC data entry into a study. And they can integrate with EMR, IRT, wearables, and other devices. Solutions that are powered by Medible are HIPAA compliant, auditable, and interoperable right out of the box. The Medible platform serves as the hub for the entire patient record with data spanning all healthcare systems. If you're interested in building clinical apps that patients love, and that bridge the gap between the clinic to the app store, check out Medible's Axon. It's easy, it's HIPAA compliant, and it's supported by a robust platform. Give it a try and create your first clinical trial app in just a few minutes. It's true, 
Go to www.medible.com to schedule a demo. Now let's jump back to the conversation. Great. So, so far we've got seven secrets. The first four are engage patient experts as peers, not as test subjects. Compensate them fairly for the requested expertise. Uh, share clear business goals and expectations and provide a candid background on the company and its goals. i uh, got three left. What are the next three? Uh, so the three are, are good. Now, now we did kind of like how to make it go really well. Here's things to avoid, you know, share upfront issues that need to be avoided. Um, it's, it's okay to say, look, we really can't talk about adverse events of our, of our product or, or medication. These are regulatory issues that we're prohibited from talking about with you and that you should be careful talking about. Um, and even to say, look, it's, it's not okay to even post on, on Twitter that you were here to talk with us today, or it's fine to talk about that. So, you know, go ahead and, and kind of create some ground rules right away. Again, We've never had someone step outside of those, and we've done um, tens of thousands of patients, experts engage with companies on highly sensitive market research and and product design kinds of activities. And the, there's never been someone who's kind of said, "Oh, I'm just going to blog about this. I don't I don't care what I said I would do." So um, they're very respectful. So be sure you tell them what should be avoided. We did hit on the idea of very importantly considering the health realities of patient experts. You know, understand, discuss upfront, and contract. Um, for the expectation that there may be times when they are too sick to work with you and that and know what you'll do to, to handle those workarounds. And sometimes, as I said, it's as easy as an alternative way to communicate with them versus in person, or it may be that there, you know, if there's a longer than a two week hiatus, do you move on and cancel the contract or what? That's something you should negotiate upfront and, and patient leaders are very willing to do that. So how are you actually then identifying the patients that are part of your platform? How are you uh, reaching out to them and engaging them and, and educating them about what their responsibilities are and having these conversations as well? Over 10 years, we've built a, a network of what we call patient leaders. It's about 125,000 people, actually, who are we vetted as the, the most engaged and influential patients in the in the consumer healthcare space, online especially. And, and out of that, we've asked people to raise their hand to say, look, I am also consider myself a business professional with expertise I can offer to the to industry, uh, if you will, and including all parts of the healthcare ecosystem. So they create a, a very detailed profile of their work expertise, their disease expertise, their experience and past histories, and as well as and, and then they're reviewed on an ongoing basis by everyone that works with them and they review the folks that, that they work with. So you know, like Uber, you get a review on both the rider and the driver. So the short answer is our job is to vet the people who apply to be a part of our on-demand consulting platform to be sure that you know when you hire them, they know what to do. They know how to manage an engagement. They know how to be a, a part of your collaboration uh, process, not 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 just a patient with a great story, which is incredibly valuable. But really, you're looking for someone who can collaborate with you on a on a peer to peer basis. We, we're going to vet to be sure that you have the the best of the best available to you. So the platform now um, has about 500 people who are available patient experts on it. We're recruiting people to it on demand as it grows. So out of 125,000, we expect we'll probably have you know 10 or 20,000 people who will who really be those business consultant ready patient experts. So our, our job is to be sure that the people on the platform are ready to step up. Excellent. And you had a final point here about privacy. Yeah, very important. And when we learned through our own advisory board is that you know, just because you know about a privacy issue from a patient uh, expert that you're working with, and, and maybe that's part of your contracting, which has been very um, disclosed, doesn't mean that it's it's public knowledge for everyone. And, and even if someone is blogging about their condition every day to kind of disclose maybe a particular health episode or something to the rest of your team or someone else is something you should ask them about first, right? And say, hey, is it okay if I tell people that you missed X, Y, or Z because of, or would you rather we just didn't talk about that? And it 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 can be confusing because patient leaders are very often you know, wildly visible public spokespeople for their disease. And, and often I compare them to the, the old invisible man model where you can see through the skin and everything is, is and they're, they're happy to be that. Here's my medical records, see whatever you want. I want to help the world to be a better place. And they are those people, but there also can be limits to how much of their very personal experiences they want to have shared. So just, just ask them what to, what's okay to share. Don't, don't assume. So how do people who are listening go from, you know, I wish I knew how to, or I wish I could to, you know, let's get started. Well, it, it's still a relatively new platform. We launched it in February. So the, the best thing to do is go in there and create a, a, a client account. It's free. Set up your company on there just like you would set up, as I said, an Uber account. And it would take no more time, actually, to set that up. And and 
propose an engagement. Say, like, I'd like to meet with five patient leaders in hypertension to your case, you know, for, for a half day in Ohio. Who can help me to find these people and organize that for me? Propose a fee that you think is fair. And if you have any questions about that, hit the chat box on the, on the bottom right-hand corner there. And there's folks on there that will help you be sure the engagement's written properly. They'll say, well, gee, you're being a little stingy there. You're going to, I want to offer, you know, 2000 not not $200 for a half day. Um, so, They'll, you'll get support from our team to be sure your engagement is one that attracts the right experts to your project. But it's it's free. It's quick to set up a client profile. There's no there's no requirement to spend any money once you do that. And as a result of doing that, you can start looking at around at the the available patient expert consultants that are on the platform too. It's uh, it's fun. And I imagine you must have a wide range of what these engagements look like. Can you give us sort of an idea of what the ranges are in terms of uh, you know is it a, a one off engagement? Is it over a period of time and you know number of people? Can you give me sort of the extremes at either end across the spectrum and and sort of what a typical one might might look like? Sure. I, I, a lot of what we do is is a little bit is is patient advisory board patient type of activities. It sometimes starts out as a one-off. Can you recruit a patient advisory board for us? Find us 10 people who have experience with uh, uh, metastatic breast cancer, which is very challenging. And that community is very tight knit. So help us find the right people to work with there. Uh, And then um, what we find very often is that one-off of find us the people to talk to morphs into, can you help us to manage that conversation and, and the event of, of talking to them? And then, you know, then a longer term engagement for that expert to manage the advisory board for, you know, a year or longer. So um, typically things start as a one-off and, and evolve into a, a, a longer term engagement. And it's probably the most frequent user case rate we have right now is, is research and advisory kind of a capacity. But we also have folks who are hired on a one-off to create content and marketing content, influencer marketing content for startup companies, very important to adoption for digital health is driven by you know genuine acceptance and understanding of the influential people in that space so if you're creating a new diabetes app god love you if you are um to have the top diabetes influencers you know writing about posting about and and genuinely understanding your product and disclosing that they're being paid to do so in the influencer marketing appropriate way um is is a key to driving adoption of your technology so so much beautiful tech is out there without without a strong adoption strategy that's really helping now i'm a little confused by what you said earlier in terms of the, the the website was just launched in February, the platform was launched in February, but you've been doing this since 2007. So what's new? WeGo Health has been around and alive since 2007, building our network, supporting our network, providing full service consulting, market research, and social media promotion services to big companies through our network. We've only recently launched this on-demand matching platform where essentially we've taken ourselves out of the picture and said any company of any size can propose to work directly with our now vetted network of patient experts. So what what used to be something that required, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a, a long term engagement with a lot of support from our strategy team. Now you can go in as a as a digital health startup and say, I want to meet two people for, for an hour on Skype and I, I'm going to pay five hundred dollars for that and set that engagement up, get it done and and you know have it all through and paid in a credit card within five days versus having to to engage our full service team. That's brilliant. I think that's a great solution. It's crowdsourced patient input. Um, exactly. it, it provides great benefits to, to both parties, and you're just creating that conduit in the middle. Uh, yeah. That's a, a great idea. Now, I know I first heard about your company at Health 2.0. I don't know why it escaped my radar screen for so long, but when I was at Health 2.0 in 2016, it was mm-hmm. a 10-year anniversary. I know you guys were making a, a big splash there. Are you going to mm-hmm. be at Health 2.0 in, in October this year? We sure will. We'll be on the main stage and, and presenting a, a, a status report on the pre-launch demo we did on the, of WeGo Health Experts, which is that on-demand digital matching platform that connects companies directly to patient experts. Last year, we were we, we showed DemoWare. This year, we're showing the live platform. Um, over 200 clients have signed up in, in the six months the platform has been live. We're going to show real use cases and live action. So I think it's fun for health to attendees to see these are the companies that are launched here that are now in meeting real needs and, and growing fast. So you can say you were there when you saw it get launched. <laughs> Brilliant. Will you be there yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. So anyone who's listening, get out, uh, go back and listen to Matthew Holt on uh, episodes 40 and 41, where he talks about what's happening at Health 2.0. It's going to be a big year this year uh, now that Hims is involved with the organization as well. So I'm sure it's going to be a great turnout. It's always a fantastic meeting. And you'll be able to meet Jack and, uh, and part of his team and uh, learn about what's happening at WeGo. So I know I met several of the people, uh, some of the experts that were there last year. So I encourage people to get out there and say hello. Jack, I've got six questions that I'd like to ask every guest. Do you have a few more minutes for me? Sure, I do. Absolutely. 
Excellent. Jack, can you tell me a favorite saying or quote that motivates you? One that I've put in, in far too many decks, but I always give him credit, is from Leonard Kish, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a bit, I'm, is it's amazing that not everyone is involving patient collaboration in their work. If patient collaboration were a drug, it would be malpractice not to use it. And that's that to me just is the that's the reality is and that's part of why we're excited about the platform. So I, I, I love that quote of, of you know it would be malpractice not to use patient collaboration. What advice do you have for others working to innovate in healthcare? I would advise them to look hard at the on-demand environment, the gig economy as a way to accelerate what they're doing. I, I can't say enough about how that's helped our company to be innovative and move quickly. We're we're contributing you know, the patient expertise to that, which has heretofore been a high friction part of it. But when you look at the on-demand expertise that's available you know, now from patients, but also from other all forms of experts through platforms like Hourly Nerd or Upwork or Catalant or TopTal, you can get so much done with brilliant experts. And I think that human piece has been a lot of what's missing from digital health innovation is, is how do I find the, you know, how do I hire someone for a quarter million dollars? You don't have to hire their, hire their brain for the time you need. What book do you recommend to listeners? Right now I'm reading one that's not a brand new one, but it's The Power of Habit. And I think that book does a lot to, as you said, outside of healthcare to speak to how do we as people in the healthcare space change consumer behavior for, for the better, right? How do, we, how do we get people to adopt healthier habits? How do, we, how do you really get inside the psychology of what, what causes someone to do something that's good for them or to cause to, to do something that's bad for them from a health perspective? And I, that, it, it's a book that really gives you insight from a from a much larger perspective, I think I find it's fascinating. What piece of software do you highly recommend? Is there a mobile app or some cloud-based software that you uh, that you recommend? I'm a music fan, and I'm I just I'm in love with my Sonos and ability to mix and match all the on-demand services that are that are along with that. I you know so many of my friends because I'm not um, 22 years old um, are, are saying what the hell my CDs are no good and I miss albums and all that kind of thing. I just I celebrate the. The, the ability to hear music that is related to the music that you know, but isn't the music you know and expose you, but also you know, to have my friend who was here visiting and is, uh, you know, share his playlist from Nashville with me, which I never would have done before. So I love that. And I think that on-demand exposure to you know, the best of the best in ways that, that are frictionless now is, is, is exciting as hell. So I, I love my Sonos and, and Spotify and Pandora and everything else that roll up underneath that. If I gave you a check for $5 million for you to invest in health technology today, how would you invest it? You know, I, I I would I would invest in the in you know finding the the three or four companies, and I'll, I I would certainly put WeGo Health in one of them. I'll have to say that that are focused on the patient collaboration experience, and and I look at comp- organizations like Health XL that are fostering collaboration, and the ones that are really making it easier and, and to put patients together with digital health are the ones that I would be investing in for sure. I think that human element is you know of, of the beautiful technology that is so much of digital health is is why we see. So many things, you know, just not hitting their goals, not failing. And if we can bring that patient collaboration in in time, that adoption rate gets gets pushed up, and long term support and, and usage gets pushed up, then we're gonna. That's that's where digital health will really start to sing. And the last question I have for you is that we make a contribution to a charity in appreciation of your time on the show. What charity have you selected, and can you tell me a little bit about what they do? One of the nonprofits that we love is is the Patients Included Movement. It's part of the Everyone Included Movement that you'll see supported at Stanford Medicine X. What it does is make sure that patients you know, get out into big industry events and become visible as, as part of the healthcare world. It hopefully pushes back on the tide of conferences that are about patients, but there's no patients in attendance or no patients on the stage. And and patients included is a movement that we've supported from the beginning. And I think that's one that, because it doesn't support a particular disease, doesn't always get the financial support it deserves, but it's one that will get the patient voice out there and uh, and really make some change happen. So I'm on their website now, patientsincluded.org. I'm going to make sure we make a donation to them. Uh, actually, I see I've not been on this website before, but I see a few names right off the bat that, uh, you recognize uh, that I recognize. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So we'll make a donation in their name, and we'll post a link to them on the website. Anyone who's listening, uh, invite you to make a contribution to this uh, organization as well. Jack, I know people can go to WeGo Health, W-E-G-O Health.com, uh, and mm-hmm. find more information there. They can find you at Health 2.0 out in Santa Clara, the October 1st to 4th. Mm-hmm. How else can people follow what you do? and keep in touch. You can sign up and create our free profile on wegohealthexperts.com or it's also available from wegohealth.com. That's the, that's the best way to do it. And there's uh, lots of contact forms there. You can follow me on Twitter at, at HealthyJack. Uh, and I'm also available through our, through our website in lots of different ways. So I, our website is definitely uh, fully formed and the right way to find us for sure. 
Jack, I appreciate you taking time to come on the program and share some of these tips with the audience about how to have great patient engagements. I uh, am very thankful that you've created this online expert platform for people to be able to engage with and get access to experts that that, uh, can contribute to their programs and wish you a lot of success. Is there anything you'd like to say to the audience before I let you go? Thanks very much for, uh, for working with patients. We look forward to seeing you on WeGo Health Expert. There you have it. That's Jack Barrett of WeGo Health and WeGo Health Experts. Be sure to say hello to Jack at the Health 2.0 meeting in Santa Clara on October 1st to 4th and attend his update that he's giving on the main stage about the rollout of the WeGo Health Experts platform. Get a full list and more details about each of Jack's seven secrets of successful patient collaboration and links to everything we discussed by visiting digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 42. While you're there, please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast apps. More great podcasts are coming up, including interviews with Jamie Edwards of Cloudbreak Health, Dr. Stefano Bini of UCSF, and many, many more. You won't want to miss them. Be sure to also check out Medible.com and sign up for a demo of Axon. You'll be surprised at how fast you can create your first clinical trial app. Tell them that you heard about it here. As always, thanks for tuning in and being a part of the digital health community. That's all for me for now. Until next time, keep on innovating. Keep on innovating.